Hello, everybody. My name is Aman Karana. I'm one of the assistant professors of radiology and biomedical engineering at University of Kentucky. I'm also one of the assistant editors of the GI subsection at the arsenic case collection. And today we'll talk about perianal fistulas. First and foremost, I think the coronal anatomy of the anal canal and the perianal region is very important, uh, specifically understanding the internal external sphincters um, and the limits of the anal canal and the intersphincteric spaces. So here we've tried to draw a coronal graphic showing the rectum up here on the top. This is the dentate line, the anal canal is below it. Um, on bo both sides, you can see this dark red uh, line, which is the internal sphincter bilaterally. This is actually a continuation of the circular smooth muscle of the rectum. It's involuntary and it's contracted during the rest. It relaxes that defecation. Between that and the external sphincter is the intersphincteric space, uh, which is an important space because it is a closed space. And if there is an ab uh, abscess in this intersphincteric space, that needs to be drained ASAP. Next is external sphincter. As you can see the label here, it is actually a voluntary striated muscle, which is divided into three layers, which function as one unit. These are continuous cranially to external sphincter, puborectalis and levator ani muscle. Um, so here, puborectalis is not labeled, but puborectalis muscle originates from both sides of the pubic symphysis and forms a sling, as you must have heard, around the anal rectum. So um, levator ani, puborectalis, and external sphincter. And the intersphincteric space lies between the internal and the external sphincter. And this coronal anatomy is important because here, further out laterally, you can see the issue of anal fossa, uh, at the level of the anal canal and the ischial rectal fossa at the level of the rectum. And then above the levator ani here is the supra levator space as the name suggests. So we will come back to this coronal anatomy and I'll show you how different fistulae look like uh, using this same graphic. But next let's talk about uh, the outline of today's brief video. Uh, we're going to talk about how to discuss a type and extent of perianal fistula when, when you're dictating these studies. Um, these are the things the surgeon wants to know. They want to know the type of the fistula, how long the fistula is, where it's going. Next, they want to know if there's an associated abscess. So if there is an interesting trig abscess, as I told you, definitely something they want to drain sooner than later. But any other abscess in the issue anal uh, fossa or if the issue rectal fossa, uh, obviously, you want to talk about if there's any associated seton. Um, seton is, uh, or seton fistulotomy is a technique where a rubber ligature or a vessel loop is pulled through the fistula. Uh, this is then tightened every couple of weeks in order to obtain a pressure necrosis on the muscle. It's slowly pulled through the muscle. This has the advantage that the muscle is slowly cut and it fibrosis at the same time. Uh, in order to cause as little damage as possible to the sphincter complex. So if the surgeon put in the seton, should be in their op note, but let's say it's not available, you should see it as a T2 dark uh, or even T and T1 dark um, filling defect within the fistula. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, you do need to comment on how much active inflammation there is. And I'm gonna show you some imaging examples and show you an algorithm I use uh, to to assess the amount of inflammation in a fistula. In females, you do talk, you should talk about the extension uh, to the introitus. This is important because they may want to involve GYN uh, uh, folks, if that's the case. Also, it may cause some symptoms which may seem like uh, symptoms from the vaginal canal drainage or uh, urethral drainage. So it's important to mention if it is extending anteriorly to the introitus in females. Um, very importantly, most of these perianal fistulas remain in the anal canal, but they, if they do go to the rectum, you do need to talk about the rectal involvement because that may need a slightly more uh, extensive surgery. And then last uh, but not least, any submucosal or intraluminal mass, and this may be completely uh, incidental. It may be uh, just an abscess, which we talked about earlier. It may actually be uh, some kind of um, a mass, which, you know, polyp, uh, for example, or hemorrhoids. But if you do see something in the intraluminal or submucosal compartments, uh, compartments of the anal canal, we do need to talk about that. So moving on to the algorithm I use, and this is how I teach my residents and fellows uh, at the University of Kentucky, uh, where we need to look at T2 
and T1 uh, images and then decipher what's in the fistula. So not all fistula, uh, fistulae are gonna be the same. Uh, there's gonna be fistulae which are full of fluid. And for that, you look at this bottom uh, graphic. So as we know fluid, uh, anywhere in the body would be T2 bright, uh, it will not enhance. So T1 post contrast, you will have a rim enhancement. So the fluid will not enhance, but the rim of the fistula will enhance. So that tells you there's fluid in that fistula. But more importantly, I think this top one uh, is what we see the, a lot of it, because a lot of these MRs are done after surgeon has already gone in and done some kind of intervention and then they get into uh, they get the MRI to figure out what's left and how much granulation tissue there is. So for that, uh, you still want to look at both T2 and T1. But if you look here, the T2 still stays bright, and I'll show you some image examples of it. But now the T1 post contrast sequence also is bright. And when I say bright, I actually mean bright within the fistula. So not just rim enhancement, but actually enhancement within the fistula. That tells you that there's something which is full of cells, that's why it's T2 bright, but also enhancing. And that's why I come up to a conclusion that that's granulation tissue. So that's very important to tell the surgeon, is there fluid, is there granulation tissue? Now, sometimes there could be scar tissue. Scar tissue anywhere in the body looks T2 dark, it's fibrosis, right? So if there's T2 dark, um, stuff in the fistula and after you give the contrast it is kind of enhancing maybe not a lot so intermediate enhancement you're going to question scar tissue as scar tissue in anyways in the body will have fibrosis so it can enhance but it's not going to enhance really bright like granulation tissue and i'll show you some image examples of that so if you can kind of try to remember this algorithm i think it's going to serve you a lot because you're going to improve your dictation you're going to improve your understanding you're going to talk more about this fistula is full of granulation tissue. Good job, surgeon. We're doing good. You know, your, your, your surgery worked. Or sorry, still fluid. There is some rim enhancement. This fistula is still active, has an internal opening and an external opening. And we think they need to go back in. And then scar tissue would something be more chronic. So coming back to that same coronal diagram I drew here and what I did here is I removed all these labelings and I try to draw the different types of fistulae, uh, fistulae types. So um, uh, the first one here is called the trans sphincteric. I just wrote that as an S to save some space here. Uh, but if you can see with this blue graphic, it actually is going from that gluteal cleft from the skin, because by definition, a fistula should go from skin into the anal canal. So from two uh, cavities, right? So one cavity is the skin or the outside, and then the other cavity is the anal canal. So the transphincteric fistula should go from the gluteal cleft through the external and internal sphincter and then open up in this anal canal versus an intersphincteric fistula. And this is probably the most important differentiation we need to make. Intersphincteric fistula goes from the gluteal cleft, but now runs inside the intersphincteric space. This is the external sphincter. This is the internal sphincter. It runs between it and then opens up in the anal canal. So that's the two most common, transphincteric and intersphincteric fistulae. The other two are suprasphincteric. And in this one, the fistulous tract goes above the external sphincter and pubic talus, and then dips down close to the levator and then enters the internal sphincter to become suprasphincteric because it's supra external sphincter versus this last one, which is called the um, extra sphincteric fistula, actually goes from the gluteal cleft through the levator ani and opens up in the rectum. And that's why I was telling you that mentioning rectal involvement is important because this will probably need a slightly more extensive surgery than the others. So transphincteric through the sphincter, intersphincteric in the intersphincteric space, suprasphincteric above the external sphincter, extra sphincteric into the rectum. So I'm gonna to try to use these graphics as I try to show you cases. So let's jump on some cases here and try to understand this uh, anatomy. So this is coronal case one, and I put it already for everybody to see that this is a trans sphincteric fistula. Uh, this is coronal T2 and this is axial T2. 
it's a little bit hard to identify, but if you look here, there's some fluid, there's some fluid from the gluteal cleft going kind of in that issue anal fat space. And here you can see it as well. Uh, on axial, you can see that fluid right here. But look what this is. This is actually the external sphincter. Same here, this is actually the external sphincter. And this fistula clearly tries to go through the external sphincter. We don't see the internal opening on these images. Again, over here, you can see the fistula going into that fat. And then on the next image, I'll show you the post contrast images where things enhance a lot. And then here, you can actually see the whole fistulous tract enhancing solidly, which means it's granulation tissue. Um, again, I'm not showing you the internal opening, but it was around 10 o'clock where it went from the external. So from outside the external sphincter goes external and internal, and that's why it's a transphincteric fistula. I think there's even a seton here. It's hard to maybe see on this screen, but there is a black kind of linear man-made line in that fistula. And I think there was a seton in place as well. Let's look at another one. I think this time it's on the other side, also another transphincteric fistula. Uh, here you can see that fluid. It's a uh, axial stir uh, or T2 fat sac. And this is a coronal stir. You can see that linear fistula now on the left side. Um, you can also maybe see an internal opening here at 12 o'clock, unclear. I think the next images will show it much better, um, but definitely uh, a fistula, which is beyond the external sphincter. So the next, next image, see how impressive it looks. Here you're like maybe questioning this as T2 brightness, but when you give contrast, you, I mean, you cannot miss it, right? It is super bright. Uh, all of that is enhancing, that's all granulation tissue. So that's actually a fish fistula which was treated. And now you can actually see how it goes through the external and internal sphincter. And it's tried to come in around that 12 o'clock position as the internal opening. So as I talked about, you gotta talk about the type. So, but you were gonna talk about the extent. So the way I'll dictate this one, I'll say it's a transphincteric fistula with an internal opening at 12 o'clock and then extending through the sphincters in the anterior, kind of in uh, ischioanal fat and then extends along the left ischioanal fossa and exits somewhere in the left gluteal cleft. So that's the type and extent. Associated abscess, there is no associated abscess. Granulation tissue and active inflammation, there's a quite a lot of granulation tissue. Again, look at the T2, mild brightness, and then becomes really, really bright with that solid bright with that T1 post contrast images. So let's see another case. This time, let's switch some gears and talk about intersphincteric fistula. So here, uh, if you look at case three, uh, you maybe try to see some uh, T2 signal here in the left uh, issue, anal fat. Uh, this image is probably not that helpful, but what I was trying to show was a seton here. There's a little black dot again. I don't know how it is projecting over here. Uh, let's see if I can try to annotate this. Uh, but there is a small black dot in this fistula, which was the seton uh, in place. So to me, right now, it looks like a left fistula or left perianal fistula. Let's go to the next image. And it makes more sense when you actually see this fistula track never leaving uh, or going beyond the external sphincter. It stays in that intersphincteric space. So it is a low left intersphincteric fistula. Also here you can see kind of hugging, even on the axial plane, kind of hugging the internal sphincter uh, and never going further out laterally. Uh, let's see another nice case of bilateral uh, intersphincteric fistulae. Uh, I think this image is even better than the last case. And, and you can see there's maybe some scars, some T2 bright uh, dark scar around this fluid containing uh, or granulation containing fistula. And again, this is the internal sphincter. I'm gonna to try to annotate for you for you all. Um, so here's the internal sphincter and you can see it very nicely here. Um, but then the two fistless tracts are actually again, sitting very close to it, hugging that internal sphincter really uh, closely. The external sphincter or the pubic talus is that sling shaped structure right here. And that's what I'm drawing right now with a double uh, red line, apologies for this uh, 
not so good drawing, but uh, this is the puborectalis or external sphincter, internal sphincter. And then these two fists with the red arrows are hugging that internal sphincter. So this would be dictated as bilateral intersphincteric fist lay. Again, coronal becomes maybe a little bit more hard to understand, but I again want to show you guys uh, with annotation uh, that this is the internal sphincter. Uh, if you remember the drawing here, obviously I've drawn the anal canal pretty wide, but usually uh, it won't be wide when people are not defecating. So that's the internal sphincter and the fist lay are hugging it really close here bilaterally. And then the external sphincter here, which is the continuation of the levator ani and the pubic talus, again, matching that angle, that line right there. So the fist layer actually sitting between the internal and the external sphincter, and therefore bilateral intersphincteric fist lay. I don't have a case of or syncteric or extra sphincteric, but hopefully you guys can see that in the literature. I'll show a reference which I use uh, for. Uh, understanding this when I was in my fellowship. Uh, and this is what I teach my fellows and my residents now. So just to kind of sum it up, I know this is not a long lecture, so we want to try to keep it within 15 minutes. Definitely need to talk about type and extent of fistula and type, we talked about the four types. We need to be able to tell our surgeons uh, which one it is. Obviously, you know, they treat them the same, but if there is an associated abscess specifically in the transphincteric uh, sorry, interesting track space, then they need to know. Seton is, is okay to talk about it. If you don't see it, it's fine. Sometimes it's kind of hard to see, especially in the T2 fat sat sequence, which is the stir sequence. Um, you do need to talk about active inflammation. And if you go back to that algorithm slide, T2 bright and T1 solid brightness is granulation tissue, T2 bright, and then rim enhancement, like any other abscess or fluid containing structure in the body, that's more fluid in the fist blend than something dark with intra T2 dark with intermediate enhancements, probably scar tissue. And then any rectal involvement, as I talked about, especially your extra sphincteric fistula uh, are going to go and involve that rectum. So that would be important. So approximately dentate lines about three centimeters or so above the anal verge. So uh, you should be able to figure out if it's going really high up. You can actually see it. Let me go back to that slide. If you can actually see it, go above the external sphincter and puborectalis into that levator ani, crossing that levator ani, you're probably into rectum. One exception is the suprasphincteric, and this one you can clearly see goes up, but then goes back down to open in the anal canal. So if your fistula doesn't go down on that coronal image, then you would consider or question it as an extra sphincteric fistula. Uh, with that, I do wanna end this uh, quick, brief lecture. Uh, this is a great paper which I've used to uh, understand perianal fistula. They talk about imaging features, some good examples. Uh, all those drawings were my own, but I'm happy to share it with you if you guys want. Uh, if you have any questions, contact me at my email address, which is amon.k at uky.edu. And with that, I want to thank you all. Hopefully you guys have a good rest of your day. Thank you.